free passage through their territory to attack the Song Chinese from an alternate front. These envoys were imprisoned. The Mongols then invaded, defeated the Vietnamese in open battle, and seized their capital city. The Viets adopted a scorched earth policy, destroying all usable pasture, farmland, and other strategic resources surrounding their occupied capital city. In no time, the Mongols and their horses were starving. Additionally, many began to contract malaria and suffer from the unfamiliar humid climate. As they withdrew, their force was harassed, ambushed, and directly attacked, causing massive casualties. Despite this victory, the Dai Viet now realized the significant threat the Mongols posed to their existence. Consequently, they began paying the Mongols tribute in 1260 in the hopes of appeasing Mongol wrath, which it did for a time. Their respite was also aided by the unexpected death of the great Kong Munka, which triggered events that led to civil war amongst the Mongols. At the time of his death, in the west, Mongol armies had just defeated the Seljuk Turks and sacked Baghdad, destroying the city and massacring its population. The ancient cities of Damascus and Aleppo were taken. Mongol envoys were then sent to demand the surrender of the Mamluk Sultanate of Egypt, the last great Islamic power left standing. The envoys were beheaded and dismembered, putting Egypt in a do-or-die situation. The Mamluks were an elite class of slave soldiers who had overthrown their former masters and established a new dynasty based out of Cairo, Egypt. The Khan Hulagu, who commanded the Mongol armies of the west, received news of the great Khan's death and a summons to return to the Mongol capital of Karakoram to participate in a curl tie to pick the next great Khan. He redeployed the majority of his army by the Caspian Sea to graze, recuperate, and gather supplies during the hottest months of the Middle Eastern summer, while a smaller force of 10,000 Mongols was left behind to hold the northern Levant until his return. As this force continued to raid southwards, the Mamluks seized the opportunity and counterattacked the Mongols. The two armies met at the Battle of Ain Jalut. During the battle, the Mamluks used their superior knowledge of the terrain to lure the Mongols into a trap. The majority of the Mamluk army remained hidden until the Mongols were in a constricted area where their superior mobility was of little use to them. Initially, the Mongols had the upper hand, but the Mamluks held firm. During the fierce fighting, the Mongol general was slain, and those that could, routed. After the decisive Mamluk victory, the Mongols were never able to gain a foothold southwest of the Euphrates River again. Shortly after the battle, the Mongols fought their civil war, by the end of which, Kublai Khan, solidified his position as the fifth Mongol Kagan, Khan of Khans, of the whole Mongol Empire. But in reality, the empire was far too big for one man to rule, especially after Kublai Khan's conquest of China. During the latter half of the 13th century, the regional Khans gradually became completely independent rulers over their own Khanates. Kublai Khan, of the Mongol Yuan dynasty, ruled over the era of the Mongols' greatest territorial extent, but that large chunk of the world was not enough. So, he then set his sights on the land of the rising sun. While in the final stages of conquering the Song Dynasty, Kublai Khan sent a modest-sized expedition, numbering between 20 to 40,000, to conquer the island of Japan, which had ignored several Mongol demands to send tribute. The Mongols believed that it would be no trouble to brush aside the islanders' second-rate military force. They were wrong. The Mongols' first overseas invasion was met with stiff resistance, as the much smaller Japanese army correctly anticipated the Mongols' landing location. They returned to their ships, and proceeded to scout different locations to land, when a severe typhoon struck the fleet, sinking many ships. The Mongols then abandoned the campaign. The following year, the Japanese executed a Mongol envoy, guaranteeing their retaliation. The Mongols completed the conquest of the Song in 1279, and began preparing a massive invasion fleet and army, which was composed of Mongols, conscripted Chinese, and Koreans. The army suffered from poor communication between the different nationalities, and poor motivation. When they landed in Japan, both sides fought to a stalemate. For months, the Japanese were able to contain the larger invasion force and inflict heavy casualties upon it. Another massive typhoon then wiped out nearly half of the Mongol invasion fleet. This greatly aided the Japanese, who killed or captured tens of thousands of enemy troops, while the Mongol commanders fled back to China. 
While the large invasion of Japan had epically failed, a much smaller invasion was successful the following year in 1282. 100 ships and 5,000 Mongols were able to conquer the capital of the kingdom of Champa to the south of Daiviet. The Cham people abandoned the coast and fled to the mountains and jungles, waging a guerrilla war against the invaders. The victorious Mongol commander returned to China and successfully proposed a plan to Kublai Khan. A new larger army would be sent south to meet up with the southern Mongol force, conquer Daiviet, and then move south to finish off Champa. The first part of the plan worked flawlessly. The Dai Viet capital was easily taken by the combined Mongol army. But just like 27 years earlier, disease set in, and the Vietnamese successfully disrupted the invader supply lines. This greatly diminished Mongol army, then withdrew past the Dai Viet borders. Two years later, a great fleet, initially intended for the third invasion of Japan, which was called off, and over 70,000 reinforcement troops, were sent to meet up with those that remained from the earlier invasion. Again, for the third time, the Mongols captured the Dai Viet capital at Hanoi. A large portion of the fleet, which was supposed to fix the earlier supply line problems, was lured into the Red River Delta. The large UN ships were trapped by iron-tipped wooden stakes in the shallow water, entrances were blocked, and the ensnared ships were boarded and set ablaze. This disaster quickly ended the war. Most of the retreating Mongols were killed, captured, or succumbed to disease, with a small number making it home. After the war, the Tran dynasty of Dai Viet made peace with the Mongols, exchanged prisoners, and agreed to pay tribute, but remained fully independent. The multiple disastrous invasions of Vietnam and Japan would end most leaders' aspirations for foreign conquest, but not Kublai Khan's. He was sick and in his late 70s. He had completed the conquest of China, the Earth's most populous and wealthy region of his day. But he may have just wanted one more great victory before his death. The perfect opportunity appeared to present itself when emissaries from islands far to the south flooded into his court, requesting Mongol assistance against the rapidly expanding Singhasari Empire. Over a short period of time, the Singhasari king Kirtanagara conquered most of the Indonesian archipelago. You can probably guess how this war started. Kublai Khan sent emissaries demanding tribute, and at first they were ignored. But their continued presence and demands quickly annoyed Kirtanagara, who had one tattooed and his ears cut off, before sending him back. Kublai Khan was outraged, and began preparing a fleet of over 1,000 war junks manned by over 20,000 men to invade. This blatant act of hostility demonstrates how powerful Kirtanagara felt he really was. But he really wasn't. Unfortunately for Kirtanagara, Kublai Khan was not the only enemy he had made. And while the Mongol fleet was making preparations, he was overthrown by a Kadiri vassal, Chea Katawang. When the Mongols arrived for the fight, the Kadiri were pleased to let them know that Kirtanagara was history. The Mongols must have felt cheated. They had sailed all that way for nothing. And then, something strange happened. The son-in-law of Kirtanagara, who had his own troops and was holding out against the Kadiri, convinced the Mongols to join forces with him, to topple the Kadiri and restore the Singhasari Empire that they had set sail to destroy. The Mongols agreed and utterly destroyed the Kadiri kingdom, most likely hoping to install a grateful leader who would be indebted to them. After many of his Mongol allies died in battle or had succumbed to tropical diseases, Rodin Vijaya turned his growing army on the Mongols and annihilated them. This revived Singhasari would be known as the Mashapahit Empire. Kublai Khan died a year after this final defeat. Since the days of Genghis Khan, the Mongols had raided the northern part of the Indian subcontinent, but had never attempted a large-scale invasion. For decades, the Mongols of the Chagatai Khanate had raided into the Punjab, and sometimes held territory there. This constant raiding, sometimes on a yearly basis, had an unintended consequence. The Turco-Afghan warlords of the fabulously wealthy Delhi Sultanate became intimately acquainted with Mongol tactics and strategy. After many defeats, they started to win a string of victories. Then, the Chagatai Khanate organized the largest ever Mongol invasion of the Indian subcontinent, with an army likely numbering over 100,000. At the Battle of Kili, many tens of thousands were killed on either side, including the Mongol commander. 
In the hard-fought battle, the Mongols gained a slight upper hand, but withdrew after their commander had died from his wounds. In the seven years following the battle, the Mongols of the Chagatai Khanate repeatedly returned to campaign in the Indian subcontinent, but never in the numbers they were able to muster in 1299. In the later 1280s, both Hungary and Poland defeated armies of the Golden Horde. The Golden Horde was a Mongol successor state. Most of the Horde's population was Turkic Cumans, Kipchaks, and Bulgars. They were known to the Russians as Tartars. This has been Epimetheus. Let me know in the comments of which Mongol invasions do you believe were the most disastrous. Rank them from biggest disaster to least big disaster. I'm curious to read what all of you think. Thank you so much for watching.